Hello and welcome to the latest installment of Helix Education's webinar series about COVID-19, the roadmap to fall 2020. And today we're talking about your teaching and learning challenges answered. Thanks everybody for joining us so far. My name is Sparky Mortimer. I'm the Associate Director of Creative Strategy here at Helix Education and I'll be moderating our discussion today. Before we get into it, if you've been with us before, you know the routine. Uh, for those of you that haven't, just a heads up, we are recording this webinar. We are going to send an email link out to all attendees so that you can watch it. We'll also post it on Helix Education's YouTube channel. So be sure to look at it there to watch on demand and share with others who would be interested in the topic today. Uh, we are also using a service called Otter AI uh, for a live uh, transcript that is paired with this meeting. And so there should be a link in the chat. So if you take a peek in the chat, you can find the link to take advantage of that service. Um, we've already gotten a lot of questions for today. That is the topic, your teaching and learning challenges answered. So we've already gotten a lot of questions from many of you uh, who are joining us today. So thank you for those questions. Uh, we're still happy to take any additional questions that you uh, come up with as you uh, hear the uh, webinar today. So there's a Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Go ahead and click that at any time and type in your question there and we will address those. Any of the um, any technical issues or anything that you have, be sure to put those in the chat and we'll address those as best you can. Uh, any other questions, please feel free to use the Q&A function. And yes, Mark, this is the Sparky Mortimer from David Letterman fame. That'll be another story for another time because I want to turn our attention to our fantastic panelists that we have today. First is Dr. Sharon Hoppus. Helix Education's Vice President and Chief Academic Officer. Uh, she's been a, a frequent guest in this webinar series so far. Decades of experience in higher education uh, with roles related to student affairs, uh, administration, faculty, enrollment, accreditation. Uh, prior to Helix Education, she was Dean of Undergraduate Programs at Golden Gate University. And so very well versed in the topics that we're going to talk about today and addressing your questions. She brings a lot of varied uh, perspectives and experience to the discussion today. So Sharon, as always, thank you for joining us. Also joining us today is soon to be Dr. Emily Wood. Uh, she's almost done with that EDD uh, at Northeastern University. So we're proud of her and keep, uh, keep uh, pushing her toward that goal. She's Helix Education's Director of Instructional Design and so a dozen years in higher education. Uh, and what she brings to our discussion today in particular is her time as a tenured professor. And so talking about uh, teaching and teaching for online and helping students achieve outstanding outcomes, even if we aren't physically able to be together is something that Emily has firsthand experience with in addition to uh, that decade of instructional design experience, uh, the last five years of which have been at Helix Education. And so Sharon and Emily, I know we've got a lot of questions to get to and a lot of background as well to get into. So Sharon, I we'll turn the time over to you to get us started. Thank you so much, Sparky. I appreciate that great introduction. So for those of you who have been on the journey with us this summer, Helix has been talking about a roadmap to fall 2020. And we know that institutions are trying on a daily basis to sort through all the information, all the opportunities, all the risk of what to do come fall 2020, whether or not they're going to open their campuses or, or what we're going to do. So we'll talk a little bit more about the full four pillars represented here, but this week specifically, our focus is on the online teaching and learning experience. So we're so glad you could join us for this Q&A. Um, we really have one goal for today, and that's that we want to try to answer your questions around online teaching and learning. And we promise that if we can't come up with a decent answer today while we're on the spot, then we're gonna do some research and we will follow up with all of you that are on this webinar to try to help get those questions answered for you. Because I know that that's one of the biggest challenges right now is how do you bring uh, minds together to brainstorm and, and really try to get creative around how we're gonna present our curriculum in this environment. And so we wanna be as much of a help with that as we can. So we're going to cover a couple of things. One is I just want to lay some foundation about why Helix is doing this, having these conversations in our weekly webinars right now, um, and then we're going to really open it up. So we love the questions that have come in so far. As Sparky said, use that Q&A feature if something else comes up. Um, and, and we're really just going to, no PowerPoint slides, no nothing, we're just going to have a conversation um, to help you answer those questions. Then I'd like to, to get in a little bit deeper on, on those four pillars of quality online education and share with you how Helix can help, what we've been trying to do uh, to support the university community um, during this unprecedented time. 
So that opens us right up to these circumstances. Uh, Phil Hill, I think, summed it up in a great graphic in really kind of thinking about these phases of the last 90 days or so. Um, and we all know that February and March was really scrambling. Um, what do we do now that we can't all be together? And that was where there was a, a real transition to uh, remote learning um, in, in that environment, taking advantage mostly of synchronous opportunities and video. Now, as we move into phase two, it's really catching our breath, doing some assessment about what worked and what didn't and why, and then really trying to elevate what we're doing. How do we make sure that we can be more accessible um, and, and serve more of our students um, in a better ways than we could in an emergency circumstance? And as we go into August and December, that's a big, I wish I had a magic eight ball that I could shake and tell me what the right answer is, but I think everyone's trying to figure out is it fully online? Is it fully in person? Is it something in between? And we're starting to see institutions make some decisions around that. But I think even the bigger conversation is what happens beyond this crisis moment? And, and have we really shifted our thinking around what can be done using educational technology to deliver curriculum or not? And we're going to dive into some of those questions today. So speaking of all those decisions, I captured this information from the Chronicle of Higher Ed this morning. They are daily updating what they know and have at their fingertips uh, around what institutions are doing at this point. I love the optimistic 67% who are planning for in-person. I hope that underneath that planning, they're also thinking about a what if. Um, I know lots of institutions are still kind of playing through scenarios um, and trying to figure out the right point and the right decision to make. Uh, but some like the California State University system have called it except for um, some very technical uh, learning opportunities where there's just no option other than to be on campus, they're going to be fully online in the fall. Um, and a number of institutions are getting creative with what they're doing. Is it a, a blended or hybrid model? Is it a shortened or shifted term structure? All of those things are, are on the table. And so we wanna talk today about how institutions can best be prepared moving forward for what needs to come. So you've heard me use both of these terms, this idea of remote learning or emergency remote teaching, and we wanna to talk today about really effective online learning. And why are these things different? I think the bottom line of it is for anyone who's taught online or done instructional design, we all know that it takes time and intentionality to create a really, really well-crafted online learning experience. Neither of those things were things that we had at our disposal in late February and early March. Um, I'm hearing stories of, of institutions that pivoted with less than 48 hours notice um, to be able to move everything from an in-person traditional learning environment to some kind of remote um, application. And so what we want to think about is, is now we know where we've been, how do we take that and move ourselves forward to really move into that effective quality environment for teaching and learning? And, and I've been asked a couple of times on these webinars, why do I feel like this is still an important discussion? If the vast majority of our institutions really do think that they will mostly be in person in the fall, why should we even talk about this? Um, and I think beyond the whole COVID-19 conversation, I think what we're learning through this environment is that this is going to be a must for crisis contingency planning. The institutions that have been through some kind of crisis by mother nature, whether it was Katrina or Sandy or, or some of those experiences, the fires in Northern California, all of those institutions began to think about what happens when we aren't together and had some level of planning around that. And I think this has been the wake up call for, for the rest of us, right? How do we really think about um, how we can leverage the technology that we have at hand to create quality learning. And I think all of us can agree, whether it's work from home or learn from home, Zoom, Google Hangouts, WebEx, not the answer. It's a nice supplement and it's a great tool to use when you need to, um, but to consider delivering all of your contact hours or all of your direct instruction via those mechanisms is overwhelming to the very best of us. Um, I've been zoomed out more than once in, in these past few weeks and I know our students are feeling that same thing. So how do we think about the value and the purpose of synchronous learning, but really thinking about the value and, um, and the incredible opportunities that come from asynchronous and we'll touch on some of that today. 
So Emily, thank you so much for joining me. I'm going to exit, exit us out of here and then and stop sharing. And then we can just have our conversation. I love it. Well, thank you, Emily. It, you know, I've had the pleasure of working with Emily now for the last five years. Um, and I find that every day I learn from her. Um, I stepped into leading uh, an instructional design team, really from the perspective of a faculty member who had taught at, online, but with very little support from a design team. So it was really learn as you go. So I have a great deal of empathy for faculty who are doing that. Um, but then also from the perspective of a dean. And I knew what I liked and I knew what I wanted my students to have for an experience. But Emily, I learned from you all the time and I'm so excited to have this conversation with you today. So let's get to one of our first questions. Um, Matthew Jones from Murray State sent us a question a couple of weeks ago, and it was a good one. So I wanted to be sure to address it here. And he asked, what are some of the biggest misconceptions of online learning? And how do you combat those misconceptions? Absolutely. So I think one of the biggest misconceptions that us in the instructional design world are dealing with now and anybody who cares about online learning is the idea that what we have seen in the past three months and as Sharon said 48 hours to move courses online that is not online learning um, I think people who have been in this field for a while will agree that online learning is very planned out it's very intentional it takes months and and thousands hundreds of hours of resources to design a really well um, to, to create a really well-designed curriculum that is online for students. So the, the fast-paced move online um, or move to emergency remote teaching, well, a very good effort in terms of having to have emergency response um, does not really meet the needs of online learners in the way that we know online learners need to be um, engaged in, in online learning. I think um, that's something that we're just going to have to combat for the next, I don't know, you're doing some damage control and, and reframing the conversation. And I think uh, a lot of it hinges on what colleges and faculty and um, instructional designers are going to be doing as we prepare for fall and for, for the 2020, 2021 academic year as a whole, quite frankly. I'd say some other misconceptions generally, if you had asked me this question a year ago, I might say that um, we often hear online learning is all self-paced and that I just log in and I click through some things and then I'm done. Um, but really what we value um, in online learning and higher education is that engagement. And what we use when we work with faculty is the community of inquiry framework as a guideline. And that really promotes engagement on three different levels. So there's student to student engagement and that's done through discussions, group projects, uh, peer feedback, lots of really great synchronous and asynchronous opportunities for that. Um, student to instructor feedback or student to instructor interaction. So how are students directly engaging with their instructor? How are they getting feedback from their instructor? And then student to content um, interaction. So how are students meaningfully engaging in content um, in, in a very using critical thinking skills rather than just reading through assignments. Um, so that's probably, I would say, one of the misconceptions on how we would battle it. The other one is that online learning is easy. Um, we do not want to battle that by making it any harder, but I think being very upfront with students about here's what you will encounter in an online course, here's some of the challenges, here's resources to help you overcome those challenges, and here's how I as an instructor can support you in your learning journey. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Emily. You know, one of the other questions that we've, um, received is is thinking about this situation of you know the technology that we have at hand and and what we've been using you know a, a couple of folks have asked questions around their lms specifically but really thinking about are we going to have to step outside of the lms in terms of effectively being able to to deliver curriculum what what are some of your thoughts with that you know, I, I'd invite all folks who are involved in thinking through what their courses are going to look like for fall 2020 and for the entire academic year to think through, um, do I really know the features of my learning management system um, and how well do they align with what I want to do from an instructional um, and learning goal perspective. 
So there's, there's often quite a few tools that you might not be aware of. So talking to your colleagues, finding out what they're doing in their classes, um, talking to you, any tech, re tech resources at your campus is um, a good approach for that. You can move beyond the learning management system. We all know that learning management systems are, are not um, one, they are very much one size fits all. And so they aren't going to have um, all the features and tools for your unique discipline and the way that you approach teaching in your discipline. But my caveat there is that it's really important that you're very intentional every time you push students or ask students to go outside of the learning management system because that is their home base. That is where they are doing the majority of their learning, not only for your course, but for other courses that they're taking online, especially if we're having a truly virtual fall. And um, being able to think through, what are the implications if I send them away? Will they be able to find their way back? If I send them yeah. to another tool, are, am I as the instructor now going to be tech support for that tool or for that website if there's broken links or if there's resources that are new or if there's updates? Um, and so I think you run the risk of um, adding more work sometimes to the instructor and adding some frustration points and points of failure as students um, are asked to move outside of the learning management system. Yeah, I, I think that's the biggest thing we saw um, with a, a couple of institutions that we were working with on, in the early days of this transition that um, it, it's, it's tempting, right? But all kinds of ed tech vendors were providing free access or you know, unlimited access for this you know, next period of time and try all these great, wonderful things. And, and I think it, it feels intriguing um, initially, mm -hmm. but when you start thinking about just the sheer tech support, the instructions to try to support students to get in and out of those systems, I think this is where the answer is probably less is more and very careful consideration of what tools you might use and a great opportunity to have conversations with colleagues in your department or within your program to have some consistency in what those other tools might be so students aren't having to relearn or reinvent the wheel every time they step into a class. Um, so that, that's really a, a great point, Emily. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so one of the other, other questions we got was around, and, and I know we get it in all kinds of varieties, but we have a question around software training curriculum and how that can best be delivered. I know we hear this about lab sciences, we hear this about some of the performance arts. What, what are some of your thoughts on best ways to leverage online learning for some of, of these disciplines or curriculums that, you know, for the longest time it's been like, no, we can't do that on, online. What, what are some of your thoughts with that? Mm -hmm. Well, it, you know, in terms of kind of the question about software and, and making that available to students, I think really carefully thinking through if I have a lab where I'm asking students to use some pretty expensive, pre pretty proprietary um, software that we do have access to on campus, but they don't have access to online um, or, or through some sort of web or cloud-based system, um, working with your institution and your IT and, and, and then going back to work with the vendors to see how can we make sure we can get that technology or a version of that technology into the hands of, of those learners. Yeah. Um, oftentimes there's stripped down versions that are web-based or that are cloud-based that um, can be utilized. And I know that there's lots of um, companies that are, are now trying to scramble to solve that problem for um, workers that were working in, in offices and now are working remote. And um, yeah. certainly I've seen that case with um, quite a few different disciplines. So that's one approach. Another thing is recognizing where you as the instructor are going to make the greatest impact. And um, I really encourage not to think of, well, I normally teach this type of software, so now I'm going to create a bunch of videos where I'm going to be teaching that type of software and how to, to navigate through that. Um, what you'll probably find online is there's some very, very good videos that are, are produced um, very professionally by the software providers who have spent lots of money, who have the designers themselves, who have high quality production teams to provide those trainings. That's very much the technical aspect and where you can have the biggest impact in your role as a faculty member teaching students how to in interact with that software is to set the context to provide that framework of here's, here's a real world problem that you would use this technology or this software to solve. Um, here's a challenge or a problem that I'd like you to go out and solve. Give them some good um, framework to do that and some good scaffolding set them off on that. And then the other part where you can have the biggest impact is the type of feedback that you're able to give along the way 
as well as with their finished products, um, because that's something that they won't get from watching a YouTube video on how to use um, AutoCAD software training, for instance. Yeah. Well, and I, and I think you, you would ask, oh, yeah, I, you know, the, the other part of that are just some of the uh, other disciplines that have been challenged and are because of the state of technology today are, are, are struggling a little bit more. And I, I know that we, we talk with a number of institutions that have healthcare related programs, for example, and there really are some amazing simulations that are out there. I think the caveat with that is, is, is maximize the use of those as much as you possibly can because it's a real opportunity through automated case study work to develop critical thinking skills and analysis and, and those kinds of things. But at the end of the day, talk to your specialized accreditors and look to them, look to your, the uh, organizations that are providing licensure um, in your state or in your region to make sure that, that whatever you might be doing is still going to keep your students uh, well within the bounds of their expectations um, for uh, students to be able to qualify and, and receive that licensure. Um, and I, I do think we're gonna see some more creativity from those agencies simply because they're facing the same realities that we are. You know, we're in, we're in desperate need for frontline healthcare specialists um, who we even saw doctors going into kind of the line of fire before fully finishing their medical training in, out of need then I think we'll see some more of that as things go on. So really having a close relationship with those licensing bodies and with those specialized accreditors is gonna be helpful. Um, the other one we get a lot of questions about are the performance arts. Um, and this one I think is particularly challenged, less so for solo performances. It's, it's not a, a particular challenge um, to be a, a solo vocalist, for example, and to do a voice lesson via Zoom. You're still gonna have some issues around internet latency. That's just the reality of what we're dealing with, but there are some opportunities there. I think the, the biggest place where we're gonna see real difficulties is around ensemble performance. Um, and once somebody cracks that technology nut, um, it's, it's a great thing, but, but uh, you know, we see the virtual choirs or virtual orchestras that are performing right now, and, and um, I'm a, a member of a performance group. And so one of my members sent it to me and said, can't we do this? And so I did some research and for a three minute song, it was about 15 hours of editing to bring all of those voices together, to line up the video precisely, to lock in in the chords or the, the musical structures that needed to be there. So, you know, really thinking about how do, how do we look at ensemble performance a little bit differently? Or can we focus right now on individual performance arts and then bring the ensemble together back when we feel like it's safe again. And this may be in a blended environment where we're really thinking about what are those high impact experiential moments, regardless of the discipline, where it's meaningful to have small groups together, to work together, and what are those times where it really makes sense for, for people to do things online and to do things virtually as individuals. Yeah. And I, I think just as you've spoken to the creativity of the organizations, I think we're also seeing individual creativity. I, I read something up, um, from the Chronicle of Higher Education had a really great um, article in one of their um, leadership and governance series recently where they were talking about these creative approaches and for a textile class um, where normally students are in a sewing lab and they are working, sending out samples to students and, and almost having like a little lab package that you can send out. Um, which, which can help with some of those, very, what we think of as very in-person experiential um, courses. Uh, I'd also invite folks to look at the learning outcomes that are part of their courses or to have a conversation with other folks who are teaching the courses um, with similar learning outcomes and to say, well, how can, we, how can we approach this in a way that might look completely different from what we've ever done in the classroom, but still get that, those learning outcomes. And a lot of it is going to be breaking up pieces and reconfiguring pieces. Absolutely. This is, this is the time that the paradigm has completely lost its structure. We've got to rethink it all, which is kind of exciting. So I think speaking of that, uh, Larissa Crawley asked, what are some of the best practices to make online presentations and Zoom meetings more engaging? Yeah, and I think part of this really depends on, on how Zoom and how online presentations are being used. And if, if that's being used as the primary mode of instruction, um, as it was for many of, of, of instructors who had to suddenly move their classes online and said, 
okay, well, I was meeting with students on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 12 to 2.15. I'm going to continue that, and we're going to meet during Zoom in those times, which works very well for uh, closing out spring, but may not be the most effective way to use the technology at hand as we head into fall and beyond. So, um, you know, I think thinking, what really is my goal in using Zoom? And can there be pieces that can be completed um, outside of an async or outside of a synchronous um, learning context. And so pulling away the pieces that might not be the most important and really letting Zoom or letting the um, online, you know, uh, classroom software uh, just focus on what you want to have accomplished in that short amount of time. Um, in terms of best practices for engaging folks in that, I would say really thinking through um, how you can ensure um, true comprehension and true understanding of what you have, um, what you are trying to teach and what you hope that the students are learning. And, and a big part of this, and if you've been in any Zoom webinars or any, any meetings in the past few months, you've probably seen some latency issues. You've probably seen um, where maybe audio wasn't connected. Maybe there was issues where people were talking over each other or somebody had to go because their dog was suddenly barking at a mailman. Um, so there's going to be those interruptions anytime we have a synchronous environment. That's one of the benefits and also one of the drawbacks of it. Um, so thinking through how can we make sure that we are providing multiple means of uh, representation for our ideas and being very redundant to a fault at times, um, making sure that student, that everybody leaves the meeting, everybody leaves um, your presentation or your online lecture with a good understanding and some of that's using some of that um, out, exit exit door um, assess, assessment strategies. So being able to say, okay, well, what was the main point? What, what, do you, what, do you, what did you learn? What are you still unclear about? And having um, that one minute paper can still be done um, using Zoom chat or using some other platform to get that feedback from students. Um, additionally, just making sure that if you are communicating something important, that you have it on the screen as well as um, speaking it verbally and other forms and that folks have access to that once they leave the meeting yeah. um, or once they leave your lecture is that there, you have the lecture notes that can be shared. And we're trying to live up to the best practices. One of our participants just asked if this uh, PowerPoint would be available, so we will be sharing those slides. Yes, absolutely. And Mark just made a note. If you'll look in your chat section, he says, I just wrote a blog post on overcoming Zoom fatigue recently. Ooh. Please check it out. And you know that that's going on my soon to be reading list. So thank you, Mark. Thank I appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, let me look. I'm just looking through our list of questions here. Oh, Deborah Kimpton asks, understanding that some students have valid reasons for not wanting to be on camera, how do you manage a class where now everyone decides they're not using their video to participate? I found it frustrating to interact with students when you have no visual cues or responses. And I feel you. <laughs> in, in, in our work with faculty, um, our team is remote. And so working internally, working externally, it can be challenging to not get that feedback and to not see um, how, how the other participants are receiving your message, um, if there's confusion, if there's questions. And that's where I encourage um, you to think creatively about all the tools that Zoom has to offer um, or your, your platform, whatever it is, WebEx or GoToMeeting. What, what they have to offer in terms of other ways for participants to show that they are engaged and that they understand and that they are able to respond back to you. Um, I, you know, I'm from the days of um, Illuminate, I think before Blackboard bought it. I, don't, I can't even remember what, what the name of it was, but we, we used that tool and there were lots of different, even back then, 10 years ago, there were little um, icons where you could have questions, oh, I, I don't understand, and you could have a little question icon, or you could have a thumbs up. Zoom has those features here, um, as well as all of the other ones. So you can ask for a quick thumbs up, who's understanding, where's what's confusing. Um, along the way, you can also ask for that feedback as you're delivering something that like, such as a lecture where you're presenting information. Um, I think it's fine that people might choose to not use their video. They're doing that for a variety of different reasons. I think especially given everything that's going on in the world and Many people are using um, learning in, in environments where they had not planned to do their learning and, and being respectful of that particular fact that folks are grappling with. Um, but I think asking then if, the, if they can 
at least give feedback through um, using their speakers or through um, using chat to type questions and to um, summarize what you have, you're sharing with them or to add on to the conversation um, is an important um, ground rule that you can set there. Oh, I love that. And I think that that idea of, of setting those expectations early and often is so critical. And, and particularly as we move into um, an environment that's not emergency remote teaching, you know, I, well, our focus is predominantly in programs that serve uh, working adult professionals who are either coming back to school to get an undergraduate degree or, or graduate programs. And, and one of the things that I often find is the, the surprise is, is not a good thing for adult students in particular, right? So if, if you know that synchronous activity is a vital part of, of the course that you're teaching, that's awesome. But again, be planful, intentional about it. And students should know what your expectations are at registration. So if you know that you're gonna have required synchronous opportunities in your class, then give those students the dates and times as they're coming into it so they can make sure that their schedules will accommodate that as much as possible. And then I think for the students who can't engage in that, then make sure you're recording, making sure that, that there's um, every opportunity for them to share in that same learning and, and that you're making it an optional activity for them. Um, so their entire success in the course is not dependent on being in that time and place. And I think particularly as we think about uh, the truth of a digital divide uh, in the world that we've discovered in these last 90 days, as we're thinking about not enough hardware, not enough bandwidth, um, kids being underfoot while parents are trying to learn, all of those things, brothers and sisters not having spaces of their own um, because it was expected that someone was gonna be living in a residence hall, um, all of those things have impact on learning. And so as much as we can, as designers, as faculty, uh, as teachers in this environment can be empathetic, um, set clear expectations for students so they know upfront what they're walking into for this fall, I think the better off all of us will be. Um, it looks like, and I'm sorry, I'm not gonna say it, Madi, Mada? I uh, asked a question, how can an instructor better facilitate learning and comprehension for subject matter that involves tactile learning strategies? This is more geared towards learning skills in programs such as nursing programs. Yeah, and I think going back to what we had begun to touch on earlier is um, really thinking through what are the pieces that are that need absolutely cannot be um, that, that need to be assessed or that need to be learned um, in a synchronous environment and and even if it's in a face-to-face -face environment i think calling out those because certainly with a lot of the um, health sciences the allied health professions you're going to see a lot where you can't you cannot see if somebody can correctly insert a catheter so if there's the clinical um pieces that you need to to um be able to see if somebody can successfully complete that uh, really go for gui look at guidance from the accrediting associations and from the, the specific program accreditors. Um, I know they've been putting out some really amazing tools. Um, I, I can go and find some and, and share some of those with you, Maida, if that would be helpful. Um, because I'll, I'll, they've been putting out some really great tools, some great webinars of their own about how to um, touch on some of those more uh, tactile um, learning opportunities. Someone else asked, um, we're, we're planning on being back in person in the fall, but know that a second wave could make that impossible to sustain. The faculty and the students were very upset by the quick transition of full online learning. How can we ease that possibility for the next semester? So I think in terms of planning out, really having a course um, design that is flexible and future-proof, <laughs> and, and one that, um, what, what we find helps is to think about what if this course is going to be completely online, and to begin with that um, vision in mind, and then to identify what are the opportunities where we can have synchronous learning, or where that would be especially important. What are the opportunities if we were going to have um, blended, or if we were going to have different um, types of modalities that we could eventually introduce? How can we do that? But um, what I found is that usually the most explicit information, the most con consistent information is going to be in an online course design. Because when we do blended or when we do hybrid courses um, and there's a synchronous component or there's an in-person meeting, oftentimes there's information that's shared in there that just does not get added to the learning management system or that just um, 
it becomes more implicit and less explicit. So what we want to do is to make sure that we're planning for um, what would it look like for an online, 100% online delivery, and then being able to scale back from there. And, and that's also, going through that exercise is also a really good point to say, oh, this is a point where absolutely we cannot truly assess this unless it is synchronous. And, and then that will help you hit those points of, here's when I need to have synchronous opportunities, and here's what they look like, and here's why. And then we can be very explicit and clear to students on um, why we're making those choices. Well, and I think from a campus administrator's perspective as well, those are going to be questions that start getting asked, right? What, as you think about your curriculum, as you think about what you're doing in your discipline, are there ways that we could do it in, in smaller numbers? Are there ways that we could do it with meeting less frequently? Um, because the use of space and the way we manage our campus environment is going to be beyond anything that we've ever expected before. So really having those things in mind by starting first with what does it look like fully online and how do I how do I almost reverse engineer it back to being uh, the, the way we've always known it, um, it gives you the opportunity to really have that flexibility. Start with 100% online and if you know there are things that are that you can't, that nicely fits in this idea of a blended model um, and then gives you the chance to really sort through what are those critical must and, and what are those opportunities for online. It looks like we, oh, you got this one for me, Sparky? Yeah, yeah. So, so this is from uh, Prudvi. He asks, I'd like to spew multiple choice questions once in a while to students during an online session and know their understanding and absorption levels. Are there any technical tools that can facilitate sending, spewing multiple choice questions while the session is going on in Zoom? So any tips or tricks around multiple choice questions in a virtual environment? Um, I, I don't think explicitly built into Zoom, not that I'm familiar with. Um, if, if somebody else knows much more about Zoom works, I'd love for the, to hear them chime in on the chat. Um, I do know that there's a few different tools that you could use um, on your own device and could share via Zoom. So one is Poll Everywhere. I've used that for conferences. I've used that in my oh, yeah. um, face to face classes. Um, and I've also used that um, just. It, I mean, even in staff meetings, it's been really useful and fun. Um, so poll anywhere, or poll, I'm sorry, poll everywhere is, is one option. Kahoot is another option. I've, I've heard mixed success. I know it's very, very popular in K-12. Um, and I do know that there's maybe some accessibility issues. I don't know if they've worked those out, but um, Kahoot could be another option um, that is really good to display the multiple choice questions and then to give um, students, you can even assign them to teams, have them answer, or just have folks answer individually. So oh, I just did. Yeah, I just well. did a. Thanks, Marcy. Yeah, thanks, Marcy. That's a great one. And I just did a quick Zoom search. You know, they've been rolling out features like crazy in mm -hmm. the last ninety days. And so we we've used the webinar polls before, and know that that's available. But it's not always. Um, you don't always get the same features in both rooms and in webinar. But if you go to the Zoom Help Center, and I just put in polls for Zoom. Um, it comes up with the information and you can absolutely do either single choice or multiple choice polling in the midst of your meeting um, and it can be anonymous and um, and there's a, a number of ways to put it together. So one of the things that I have found is that the Zoom Help Center is really good. Um, it gives you all kinds of different ways to look at um, from Mac or from Android or whatever uh, hardware you might be using or operating system, it gives you those options and screenshots of it. So when I've been stuck on things, I've, I've gone to Zoom and it's helped a lot. Uh, and Carly shares that their blog is also really good too. So. Oh, good. I'm learning something new too. So I, I love yeah, that. There you go. Today. So uh, yeah, so I put a link, I put a link to uh, an article on the Zoom Help Center about polling. And, and yeah, it, it, it looks like, and we've got a couple of people weighing in that uh, a pro account or a certain type of level account is required oh. to be able to do a poll. Um, but uh, between uh, Jane talks about Slido, Slido, something, something like that. I'm, I'm learning new pronunciation oh. and vocab all the time. Uh, so yeah, so, so Jane's got that, Catherine. So yeah, it, it may depend on the type of account um, that you have, but yeah, that, that Zoom article uh, from the Zoom Help Center there. If you do have the, the kind of access where you can set up a poll, it looks like that's how you could get it done. And Mark tells us that in the up and coming Canvas version that it will be part of studio recordings as well, which will be nice. Cool. Awesome, that's great. 
Uh, should we move on to Claudia's question? She's got uh, yeah. kind of a two-parter here. So Claudia asks, one, are assessment tools available to measure student engagement online? And so if the answer to that is yes, and I'm going to presume it, it is one way or another, uh, how, what, what are they and how reliable are they? So what, what sort of assessment tools, Sharon and Emily, have you seen out in the market? You know, I think part of it is to think about how we're talking about student in student engagement um, and online student engagement specifically. I, I, in, in my past life, I did quite a bit with um, student engagement in the context of how that relates to um, student success and student completion. And that's a different measure than in my individual class, how can I tell if students are engaged, although they are related. So there's, there's surveys of student engagement, there's, there's the um, NESI, there's the SESI as tools to measure student engagement in a very broad sense. They also have quite a few um, tools to measure student engagement generally, but I think that might be more appropriate for a student affairs um, conversation. In terms of measuring student engagement in online courses, I know that there's some tools I'm trying to search and get some up really quickly. Um, Sean, I don't know if you have one that, that you use that comes to mind. I think a lot of it really depends on how we're defining engagement. Yeah, I, I think the other the other piece that that is often overlooked um, is the set of, of tools that underlay most of our LMS systems at this point, where you can really go in and understand um, who's kind of connecting, clicking through, how deep are they going on a page? Are they actually watching the videos that are embedded? Um, you know, to as simple as have they even logged in? What does that look like? And what's yeah. the timing on that? So I think we, we often overlook what's already built into our LMS systems. Um, and so I, I would encourage you to, one, um, particularly the, the, the big ones, Canvas, D2L, uh, to some extent Blackboard, have some great user communities that you could go out and see what some of those analytic tools are and what's available. Um, and then certainly to talk to your LMS administrator to get more insights on, on what you may be able to do. Newer versions of Moodle, I, I know, have some other really nice components around that as well with kind of the, the tax bar and completion bar and those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. And, and Claudia, I think as we think about using those um, latent sources of, of data um, that are within the learning management system to measure engagement, um, know that that might only tell part of the story and, yeah. and that um, that will tell you who was clicking and where they clicked, maybe how long they were on a page, whether they watched all of a video or not. Um, but you don't really know what was going on in the background. And to some extent, we'll never know. So that's why I think pairing that with um, opportunities to, to check in with students, whether it's informal and, um, you know, what's working about the class, what's not working, um, you know, how can you, how could I engage you more? Or, or what are you looking for in this? Um, using that as an opportunity, as well as um, some of the more formal uh, student surveys that, that might be out there, and to really try to pair those. And, and I would say, too, from a qualitative perspective, I find that by really watching and paying attention to the discussion forums is a great way for me to get insight on how students are engaging with the content that's presented, the way they frame both their initial response and their responses to their colleagues in the class, shows me a level of understanding of that content or whether they're phoning it in and gives me an opportunity either to, to push a little bit in the forum if I feel like it's going to be value to the greater group, group or to reach out individually or to bring in my, my student success, student care team to help me figure out what might be going on with this student. So that, that for me is, is probably the, the, a, a really nice qualitative real-time look at what's going on with the students. Let's see, it looks like uh, Gisela asks, uh, how to ensure students are not disadvantaged by teaching online? Mm, this is, a, I think, a really important question that we're having um, as we think about who has access to these digital tools and where we're really seeing the gaps of where students were utilizing either campus resources, computer labs, libraries, public libraries, um, as sources where they were completing a lot of their um, digital work or sub digital submissions. And now that everything has moved online for many of those courses, um, we're seeing kind of the cracks begin to show um, in a much brighter light. Uh, so I think part of this is understanding who your students are. And um, one of the advantages of, of 
um, winter term or, or our spring term is that we knew exactly who we had already engaged with those students before yeah. we had to move online um, or move to emergency remote teaching. We're going to have a little bit less of a sense of what technology they come with, what their technology um, comfort levels are and their skills and, and their access to internet. But I think that's a really good question to talk to your colleagues about, um, see if you can get information from your student care or student success coaches about um, what tools they have, what some of those challenges might be in terms of accessing tools or internet and also to poll students early on and, and maybe even having that as, the, as one of the, um, the first uh, opportunities for them to engage in the class or as you send out a welcome letter inviting them to come into your class um, to, to check in and see what kind of technology they have. They can submit it as an anonymous survey and then you'll have a better sense of what you're working with and may need to adjust some of your um, requirements um, and to think about also how students are, are accessing the course. Are they accessing it through mobile? And, um, if you've developed an online course, have you tried to access it through mobile? It's, it's often surprising um, that things don't display the way we think they're going to display. And, and then working with um, your colleagues or others uh, on, in your campus community to try to resolve those issues. Yeah, and, and I would say there's, there's kind of two levels. I think one is at the most local level in the classroom making sure that all of your documents are accessible. And now with tools in Microsoft and in, Do in Adobe, it's really simple to do a quick check to see are all of your alt tags showing up the way they need to. Is this really a, the, at the simplest level an accessible document? And then I think there's the larger public policy conversation. Um, and I think one of the things that we're seeing elevated that as much as we talk about roads and bridges, we need to be talking about bandwidth and internet accessibility as being a, a key infrastructure uh, piece in uh, throughout our communities. And so there's, I think there's gonna be opportunities from, a, from that public policy perspective to address some of this as well. It doesn't fix what we're dealing with today, um, but it certainly has shown a bright light on where the gaps are and, and where help needs to happen. Yeah. yeah and I These think are great to... questions. Oh. oh, go ahead. I think we're going to be providing some um, different tools or uh, I, um, some videos to show how to check for accessibility, but there's also some really great documentation out there. Um, on the Microsoft website has some, some great documentation on how to check for accessibility for both um, Word and PowerPoint. And YouTube has a, a search feature where you can filter by closed caption video. And, and I use that all the time because a lot of the really great videos I find um, aren't captioned. And so I have to go and find alternative versions, either additional versions that are put out by the same um, author or publisher, um, but, but have a, a captioned version or, or putting out uh, maybe finding some alternative content, but knowing that um, it might not be as good as my original video that I loved, but at least everybody can access it equally. You know, and I found that this is a great time to advocate um, for students and, and for those who need that level of accessibility. I have over, you know, my time of, of doing this work in design, uh, one time sent a quick note to somebody on YouTube and I was like, this content is so great. If only it were closed captioned, I would bring it into an undergraduate business course. And within 24 hours, they had closed captioned it for me and sent me a note back. Um, and, and have done it with organizations and said, wow, it's really great you're selling this product. It's too bad that you don't have closed captioning on all of your videos under, you know, underlying your, your sign in. And so I think this is a great time for advocacy as well when we think about those issues around accessibility. Yeah, and to, to share another success story around that, um, there were some really great John Stewart videos that um, one of the instructional designers on our team wanted to um, use and, and really supported on instructor's assignments. They had to respond to those videos. Um, and so there was, we couldn't just not have those. We um, contacted Comedy Central and within, I would say maybe it took a little bit longer because they're working on the skeleton crew now, but I think within three or four days, we had the captions for all those videos um, and transcripts as well. So, yeah, that's great. It, I think people are motivated to do this, especially as they're seeing that um, closed captioning is not good just for people who um, truly need it, but also if I'm on the bus and I uh, you know, don't have speakers. I can, I can watch a video and I can still understand what's going on. Um, or if I'm, an, an English is not my native language, I have that option to see what people are saying. Yeah, that's, those are great points, Emily. And that's a nice segue when we talk about the work that, that we try to do as designers. Um, one of our participants asked, 
kind of what are the, the best credentials for someone uh, who is a distance learning instructor or a designer? What are the things that are, are best received in the field? So I guess I would, I would shift this a, a little bit and say, so Emily, you're director of, of uh, instructional design for an organization that provides these services. What are you looking for when you're looking to hire an instructional designer? Absolutely. So um, there are quite a few credentials. There's Masters of Educational Technology um, and Masters of Curriculum and Instruction out there. And those can be useful. Um, what I, for, for who we're serving at Felix Education and for the work we do, which is very heavily facilitated with subject matter experts who are faculty who are embedded and working within a program on a college. So I'll, I'll kind of preface all of that. Um, I, I want to have instructional designers who have experience being faculty um, within higher education, who have taught online or taught face-to-face -face and moved courses online or have taught in both modalities. Um, because I think the way that we can frame conversations with our faculty subject matter experts and with other folks on campus that are stakeholders becomes so important when we can have it as a colleague um, and so that's, that's one way to be really well received in the field. Uh, also looking for advanced degrees um, and, and terminal degrees, not necessarily within education um, or a doctorate of education uh, specifically or a PhD, but um, advanced degrees in the field that have allowed you to have those opportunities to serve in a faculty perspective. Um, there's also quite a few certificates for instructional design. And I think whether those are resulting in college credit or, or not, I think being able to demonstrate that you have an interest in staying current in the field, that you have an interest in knowing that there's theory behind what you're doing and to think about the research that goes into why I'm making a design decision is something that I, um, I hold in high esteem. Awesome. Thank you so much, Emily, for joining me today and having this conversation. Um, I, we hope that it's been helpful for all of you. I'm just going to go back and share my screen again real quick. Just to be able to share with you about the four pillars of quality online education here at Helix and how we hope that we can help you as you're moving forward and looking at fall 2020. So we've really done some thinking around what are the key components of a successful move to an online environment and based on our experience in the field have, have kind of bucketed it in these four areas. It, thinking about it institutionally, structurally, operationally, the conversation we had today around teaching and learning, uh, how do we engage students and make sure that they're successful um, in their time in, in an online environment? And for those of you working in more traditional environments, how do you set expectations for students and their parents as you look towards your planning for fall 2020? And all of those things are available in, in what we want to deliver to help you as you're moving in. So we've been doing this for over 30 years and we have been successful at it, but we've had some bumps and bruises along the way and a lot of learning along the way. And we wanna bring that to bear to support all of you in the work that you're doing on your campuses to help you move quickly into this kind of new environment or new future of higher education. So we hope you'll take advantage of our website where we've put together a number of resources all to help accelerate that move towards online um, and to really support your efforts. So on our website, you'll find each of these pillars. Within those pillars, you're also going to find a number of tools, rubrics, templates, benchmarks, KPIs. All of our webinars are there. And we have podcasts that are there, some how-to guides in each one of those four pillar categories. And all of those are available to use at your leisure. Um, no expectation of a login or a sign in. We just want you to be able to have access to all of those materials. And we're going to continue our week by week journey, bringing you new information, having additional conversations in each of these as we move forward. Um, and we'll keep doing this as long as it's needed. So long past July 6, if, if we still see that institutions are really challenged with thinking about how they move forward, we'll just continue our road um, and our journey along the way. So you can find all of this on our new Future in Higher Education website. It's our URL, helixeducation.com slash new dash future. Um, and all of this is available there. You'll see all the materials, all the professional development tools, things that we use on our own internal training uh, that we want to make available to you. But we also want to say, hey, if you've got more questions, if there are other things that you need support with, 
please don't hesitate to email us at newfutureinfo at helixeducation.com. That email comes to a number of us. We're going to figure out the right person in our organization to best support you and to answer your questions. Um, so feel free to send those things in. If there are things that we missed today that you hoped we were going to address, let us know. We're happy to follow up with you and get you some more information. So we hope that you felt like we reached our goals today, that we really were able to answer some questions. I don't think there was too much that was still lingering out there, but you know, if you think there's something is, there's our email address. Feel free to get in touch with us. So thank you from the academic services team at Helix. Sparky, I'll turn it back over to you. All right, so just one more time before we leave, Sharon, if you could go back to the slide that has our, uh, our web address and that uh, email address. Uh, take a screenshot, type it into your browser, uh, uh, do something so that you can preserve that. Uh, once again, as a reminder, we have been recording uh, today's webinar. And so uh, we will, as soon as we're done here, we'll start getting it ready to get placed on Helix Education's YouTube channel. And we will send out a link to attendees to watch that on demand. And please, we encourage you to share the webinar and these resources with others around you who'd be interested in accelerating their transition to fall 2020. So Sharon and Emily, one more big thanks from me. Thanks to all of you for attending and particularly for your questions. We hope you stay safe and we look forward to joining you again next week on the road to fall 2020. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.